On Wednesday nights, we have been studying on predestination. It's probably one of the most misunderstood words in all the Bible. If a man doesn't believe in predestination, he doesn't believe the truth. Free will is a lie when it comes to man's will. Man's will is bound to sin. God's will is forever, and he said it never changes. Now, I wrote something on the board. Predestination is not contingent on what we are willing to do spiritually. First of all, because the Bible says there's none good, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. In Psalms 39 and 5, David said that every man at his best state is altogether vanity. In Ecclesiastes 7.20 he says, There is not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. Nobody has the will and the ability to come to God on his own because he is dead in his sin. He is a pile of dung. Someone was telling me, it may have been one of y'all this past week, they were listening to a preacher, and he was preaching at predestination and at God being sovereign. And then he said, if you will only let him come into your life, you mean I am dead and I have to let God something do, let God do something spiritually to me and make me alive when I have no ability to will, I'm not alive, I'm dead in sin. We call the study of this the doctrine of sovereignty. Now, the independent Baptist I was raised around, they'll say sovereignty, but they don't mean it. Let me read to you the word sovereign. The word sovereign is not in the Bible, but the concept is God's ordination, his predestination. That is there. This is the word sovereign. It comes from the Middle English, S-O-V-E-R-A-I-N-E. S-O-V-E-R-A-I-N-E. Now, Middle English was around 1200 to 1400 A.D. Or it comes from the old French, superanos, S-U-P-E-R-A, S-U-P-E-R-A-N-U-S. Now, the word super comes from the Greek word hooper. You know, when the guy wrote Superman, he wrote that, I believe, the year I was born, 1939. Well, he could be called Hooperman because that word hooper means above or supreme. It means above. You remember we've talked about God resists the proud, and the word proud over there is H-U-P-E-R-E-P-H-A-N-O-S. And it comes from hooper, or super, meaning above, and P-H-A-I-N-O-S, and that means to shine. And God, when a man wants to be supreme and be sovereign, he wants to shine above others, and God, A-N-T-I-T-A-S-S-O-M-A-I, God resists him. He is anti, that's a construction of, of that word anti, when we are born again, we are born A-N-O-T-H-E-N. That is the word again, and it comes from A-N-O, and the root word is A-N-T-I, and that means in opposition or in the place of. Now, when we place ourselves in place of God, he is anti tasso Tasso, he's got a tasso. When the scripture says in Acts 13, 48, as many as were ordained to eternal life believe. It's that word tasso, and it means has been arranged according to the arrangement of God. So when we have our own arrangement, he is anti-tasso us. And he's making war with us, those who want to shine above and be hooper or super 
are sovereign. Man is not sovereign. God is. And it comes from the Latin super, meaning above or over. Now, some people will say, well, if we'll only let God, he'll come into our lives. It means above or superior to all others if we'll let him. Uh, it means chief, greatest, supreme, supreme in power, rank, or authority if I let him have authority. No. It means of or holding the position of ruler. Is he ruling? Yes. Is all existence and power come from God? Certainly. <coughs> it means royal or reigning, independent of all others. That's what man tries to be. When he says, my will, that word hooper means I am sovereign. I will shine above others, including God. The only place you can shine is in the dark. And the moon worshipers were the Babylonians, and Babylon mothered all idolatry, and they did it. Don't let us make us a name, pride, self. If you get in the sunlight, you can't shine. And if you get in the light of Christ, and you're walking in the truth, you cannot shine. The only place a man can exert his will is in the dark, and his will is fixed on sin. He is not superman. There's no such thing. <coughs> it means very effectual. A person who possesses sovereign authority or power, if we let him... How stupid and ridiculous. That's like saying, God, you are sovereign in the universe. If I let you, there's one power that's stronger than God in the universe, and men call it free will. Baloney, hogwash. I hate free will. That says man is superman, is what it says. He is hooperman. He shines above all others. God's will, God's predestination is not contingent. I've been learning something from Mr. <coughs> Luther this week. I've been reading something on contingency. Let me define the word contingent for you before I read from this. I'm going to read to you the word contingent. Now, when people say, men try to change the definition of predestination when they say, the man who believes that his will, he has to let God do something in his dead condition in order for God to do something, he is saying, God, I will let you do your will. And when they quote Romans 8 and 29, when the scripture says, for whom he did foreknow, I don't think I've really made this clear yet. I need to make this word foreknow clear with the word contingent. This is the word that all the free will people define the condition of foreknowing or the condition of predestination. When you quote Romans 8, 29 to them, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren they say, see, God foreknew who would. They say, God looked way out here. He looked way out here uh, in our lives, and he knew that somewhere down here that we would, by our own free will, accept him. And therefore, he predestined contingent on what he knew that we were able to do and we would do. That is a lie because God himself says from eternity, he says, from eternity, he's declared, Isaiah 46 and 10, he said, I'm God, there's none beside me. I have declared the end from the beginning and from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand, I'll do all my pleasure. All these things that have not been done yet, God has declared them to be done, and they will be done. And Ecclesiastes 3.14 says, I know that whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever, O-W-L-A-M, and that word olam to the Jew, men, it always has been, it always will be. We think forever is from now on, 
But you see, we live in time. God lives outside of time. And everything he has done has always been, always will be. Yes, the New Testament word is Ionos. It means forever or everlasting. And it cannot be changed. In fact, look at it. Look at that in uh, Ecclesiastes 3.14. That's one of my favorite all-time verses. And I want to show you that God's will is immutable. It's not contingent on anything we'll do. I've got so many things. I'm picking up my wrong book. Go to Ecclesiastes 3.14. Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes comes right after Proverbs. Ecclesiastes 3.14. I want to show you tonight that God's will is immutable. It is unchangeable. Now notice, I want you to notice what people say. 15 days. Huh? Well, we'll do, three, we'll do 15 also. Now, what people say, they say that people who believe in free will, here's what they say. They say our salvation is contingent on what we are willing to do. Well, the Bible says we're dead in our sin. We're not willing to do anything righteously. And they will say, now God says, you are going to hell. You are going to hell. Uh, uh, if, if, I've got my mind made up, send everybody to hell, if somewhere they don't accept me. And if, if you accept me, instead of sending you to hell like I intentionally, like I intended to do from the beginning, I'm going to change my mind contingent on what you will do with your will. What they're trying to say is God's will can change. God's will can change if you will change his mind for him by accepting him. That's a lie. They're saying that he had his mind made up to send all men to hell except those that are willing to accept him by their own dead will. And if they'll do that, he'll change his mind by sending them to hell. And they give these invitations and say, this may be your last opportunity. There's no such thing as a last opportunity. You are either a vessel of mercy from eternity or you are a vessel of wrath from eternity and it can't be changed. That's what Ecclesiastes 3, 14 and 15 says. Here it is. In fact, all through here, the third chapter of Ecclesiastes, let's look at verse 1. To everything there's a season and a time to every purpose under heaven. The old group, the birds, wrote this, wrote this down in a song, and they told the truth. A time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant. And by the way, God says, I kill, I make a lie. The keys of death and hell are in the hands of Christ, not in Satan's hands. When God opens, and Brooks said something about Satan being in hell one day, and I said, where'd you get that idea? And he said, he went, huh? He said, what? From the movies, I guess. Because Satan ain't in hell yet. Because the rich man in Luke, the 16th chapter, he died and in hell. He lifted up his eyes, being in torments. He cried, Father Abraham, sin Lazarus, let him dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I'm tormented in this flame. And he said, no, son, remember thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things and Lazarus evil things. Now he's comforted and you're tormented. Besides this, there is a great gulf fixed so that those are there can't come here and those are here can't go there. Those that are there are never coming out. And when Satan is cast, what about purgatory? well, we don't, we don't believe in purgatory, do we? <laughs> word purgatory, word purgatory comes from purge. And Christ has purged us from our sins with his own blood. We can't do any of it. Now he says there's a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to pluck up that which is planted, a time to kill, and God does it. And a time to heal, a time to break down, a time to build up, a time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to mourn, a time to dance, a time to cast away stones, and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace. 
in a time to refrain from embracing? How about not bidding man Godspeed, huh? The scripture says if anybody brings any other doctrine than truth, don't bid him Godspeed. That's the word caro, C-H-A-I-R-O. And that means cheerful. Don't be cheerful to a man who preaches free will. I'm not going to, y'all may not know this. This is the only family and friends I've got here. I do not have somebody outside of Grace and Truth Ministries that I go fishing with. I don't have anybody out of this group that I go to the park with or I go bowling with. The only people I know and want to be around are the people in this group. And every time I get around anybody here, what do we talk about? The truth. The truth. Now, if I go fishing with you, I like to fish, but uh, I'm going to take my Bible with me. I'm not liable to stop and read the Bible a while. I might take my concordance with me, a couple other books. Can I help us get some fish? Yeah. Yeah. There's people from growing. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Now, there's a time, and we're not to bid God speed. That means also it comes from charis, meaning gracious. See, I don't like to hang around people who believe in free will. I don't like free will. I hate free will. I said it last week over and over. A time to get, a time to lose, a time to keep, a time to cast away, a time to rend, a time to sow, a time to keep silence. When Jesus was condemned, he, as a lamb, brought to slaughter. His sheep before his shears is dumb, so he opened his not his mouth. And Pilate said, don't you know I've got the power to release you? Why aren't you talking to me? And he said, you don't have any power except it be given to you from my Father, which is in heaven. You can't release me. And from that day forth, Pilate sought to release him, but he couldn't. There's a time to speak, a time to love. A time to hate. David said, the scripture says, God loved Jacob, hated Esau before either were born before either one had done any good or evil. And that's quoted from the first chapter of Malachi and in the, <coughs> and in the Strong's Concordance. Mr. Strong doesn't give us a sufficient definition of the word hate. Go to Malachi where it was originally quoted it is the Hebrew word, S-A-N-E. It looks like sane, but it's pronounced sonne or sona. And that means to despise and be disgusted with. He said, and it wasn't contingent on what Esau was going to do before Esau was born, before he had done any good or evil. God said, Esau have I already in the past, before the foundation of the world, Hated. You mean he can't hate, hate who he wants to? People say, God don't hate. David said, God, these are your enemies. Break their teeth, God. <laughs> don't sound very nice, does it? <laughs> and he said, teach me to hate those that you hate with a perfect hatred. Don't sound very nice, does it? Jesus wasn't nice. Read the 23rd chapter of Matthew. A time to rent, a time to sow, a time to keep silence, a time to speak, a time to love, a time to hate, a time of war. God will make war with you and me when we're proud and we try to be sovereign. In a time of peace, great peace have they that love thy law, and nothing will offend them. That's the word shalom. What profit hath he that worketh in that wherein he laboreth? I have seen the travail which God hath given to the sons of men. God gave us our travail. He gave us our hurting to be exercised in it. He hath made everything beautiful, pleasing to him. Everything's not beautiful to us. But it's beautiful to God because we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are thee called according to his purpose. And it's all beautiful in his sight, even the good and the bad. The evil, yes, he said, I am the Lord. I make peace and create evil. He said, I, the Lord, do all things in Isaiah 45 and 7. He creates evil. People say, well, that just means something. Uh, to cause confusion. It's the word wrong. It's the same word that's in complete juxtaposition. Juxtaposition, J-U-X-T-A-P-O-S-I-T-I-O-N. That means in complete the other end it is the total other end of good. It is the word, 
the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God said, I make evil. I made the evil tree. Now, if he didn't want Adam to eat of the evil tree, why did he make Adam out of corrupt dust, and why did he make the evil tree, and they put him in a garden where it was sitting? People say, oh, God can't be touched with evil. Yes, we know that, but he's got a servant who can. And his name is the devil, Satan. And God, our God's working all this after the counsel of his will. Now look here. Also, he has set the world in their heart so that no man can find out the work that God maketh from the beginning all the way to the end. He does it all. People say, I don't like that. Well, God's about 500 million billion miles high when he's small. And he's got a shirt collar about the size of the Milky Way when he's in reserve. Reach out and grab him by the collar to judge him and say, I don't like that. I know that there is no good in them but for a man to rejoice and do good in his life and also that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good all of all his labor. It is the gift of God. What he is saying, don't pile your money in the bank. Work 16 hours a day and say, if I can just stay miserable for the next 20 years, I'll put enough money aside uh, where I won't have to worry again and you'll never quit working. He's saying work, sleep, Rest and enjoy the work of your labor. I have never met a man that's seeking money that did that, including me when I was seeking it. I've sold millions of dollars of real estate in Andersonville for years. I was one of the top salesmen in Sumner County in Middle Tennessee. I had tremendous potential selling houses. I just stayed sick all the time. I'd work about six to seven months a year, and I'd sell a million and a half, two million dollars, and I'd be sick during the prime season selling that much real estate. And I never, ever felt good because I wanted more. Every time I'd get a bunch of checks, I'd say, this isn't enough. Now, here it is, verse 14. I know that whatsoever God doeth, well, what does he do? Everything. It shall be olam forever. From now on, it always has been in the mind of God. His will is unchangeable. You cannot manipulate the will of God <coughs> by accepting him or praying. Prayer changes nothing. I did a take called prayer changes nothing. Jim, I don't like that. I'm not sorry to tell you. The word prayer is P-R-O-S-E-U-C-H-O-M-A-I. It comes from pros, meaning to motion forward, and U-K, meaning to will. It means to will forward or bow down to God's will because Romans 8 and 26 says, we know not what to pray for as we ought. And the scripture says in the sixth chapter of Matthew, Jesus said, he said, he knows what we have need of before we ask. Before we bow to him, he knows. Prayer is bowing to the will of God. Besides that, verse 16 of 1 Corinthians, the second chapter says, Who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? You're going to tell God when to make somebody well? You're going to tell God when you need a job? God says, I've got a fiery trial for every one of my children. You say, yes, but God, I think it's time for me to make my success. No, he's going to put us in the fire, and burn self out of us, and that is his success. And besides that, we cannot know the will and the mind of God. I've said this so many times. God puts a man in a fire. The man has got all this heathenism in him, and the guy's been a wild, wild as a hoot out, and he comes to an understanding of Christ, and so... God puts him in some real heavy-duty problems. God says, I got a 20-year fire for you, and by the 20 years is up, 
I'm going to get you down to this level, and then I'm going to take on some more fire and get you down to this level. I'm going to get you on your face eventually. And he's about six months into the fire, and he goes to one of these charismatic churches who believe you get what you want when you say it. And they say, now, God, we pray that you heal this man, right? Right? It's so stupid, Pat Robertson saying, and God, we pray, right? And God's saying, he's going to say now any minute. Now, I hope I get this right, Pat. Okay, when you say now, now, did, it, did I do it right? Pat, did I do it good? You moron. <laughs> right now. They think if they'll yell now real loud, that'll make God go, okay, I did it. How stupid. It's idiocy. You say, didn't the Bible say that the faith of some were made whole? Faith is the gift of God. And every time he said, thy faith has made thee whole, every time. Now, the reason I know it, I've got books you can check it out in. And every time he says, thy faith, there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism. There's not a faith here for getting saved. Get saved. I hate get saved. There's not a faith for saved. And this is tied into Jim. And then there's another faith. It's faith, and it's called a magic bubble. And these are for the things that I want. No, no, no. Faith dies to self. Faith is the substance. Substance is hypostasis. Hypo means under or through the stasis, the staros, the cross. So if I'm dying, how am I going to be praying for what I want? <laughs> Stupid, isn't it? This and over here, this and over here is commanding God for what I want, and this one's dying? Huh? Isn't it dumb? It's stupid. Faith is the substance. Substance, hoople, stasis. Stasis comes from stao and histome, which means to stand upright. The Old Testament sacrifice was said to be upright, and we get the word cross from that word stasis, staros. It's a daily dying to self. So I have to crucify myself and say, God, what would you have me to do? Do you want me to keep this bronchitis? That's up to you, God. Thank you for bronchitis. Now let's look at this. Look over here. Verse 14. I know that whatsoever God doeth everything, it shall be forever. Nothing can be put to it. You cannot add one thing to what God has done from forever until always. That word put is the word Y-A-C-A-P-H. Y-A-C-A-P-H. Now, it means to add to. It means to add on top of. It means to augment. It actually means, when you look it up, it means add. You can't add anything to the will of God except the will of God, and that's all. Nothing can be put to it, nor anything taken from it. Those are two of the most important statements in the Bible. You cannot add a job where God don't want you to have a job. You can't add a new car where he don't want you to have a new car. You cannot add a bunch of money. You cannot add peace of mind by having things and stuff. And you cannot take away from the will of God. You cannot take cancer away where he wants it to be. You can't take death out of the hands of Christ and say, God, we, we command right now. And that ignoramus Richard Roberts, when he says, what is so stupid? God puts us in the fire. This is scary. God puts us in the fire, and he's the one that's got us under the trials and tribulation. And, the, and Richard Roberts... And those guys on TBN and Paul Crouch and the rest and Benny Hinn, they turn their hands to the sky and they point at the one. They point at the one who's doing the fire. And they say, Satan, get your hands off of my God's property. Well, their God is the God of this world. And they switch roles with Jehovah and the devil. It's what they've done. They're pointing. Don't they do that? They'll say, Satan. They'll call God Satan. 
and they'll say, get your hands off of God property. That's not capital G-O-D-S. That's little G-O-D. That's the devil. They're calling good evil, evil good. They're calling bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. And God says, woe unto the man that does that. There's a cry of damnation against those people. That's why I call that DBN. It's the Devil's Broadcasting Network. It's not TBN. The word devil is the word daemon. It means distribute fortunes. What do they pray? What do they preach? They preach a doctrine of money. That's what Satan preached to Jesus when he said, fall down and worship me. I'll give you the world. That's the God of this world they're talking about. I don't like those people. They are evil. Anybody who tells you can have what you want? No, sir. You can have what God wants you to have, and that's all. And you can't add and take away cancer or new jobs. <clears throat> and he said, nothing can be put to it, nor anything taken from it. And God doeth it that men should fear before him. That word taken is the word gara, G-A-R-A. It means to restrain or withdraw. You can't take anything away from the will of God. His will is not contingent on what we'll do or what we'll let him do in our lives. Let me read the word contingent. Contingent here in Webster's Dictionary. The word contingent is not in the Bible, and it's God's will is not contingent on what we will let him do. Because if it is, then we are Superman. We are Hooperman. We are Sovereign Man. Oh, me. That's kind of tough, isn't it? Let me look at contingent. Wait a minute. I lost my place here. Contingent. Hold on. Contingent. Now, here's the word contingent. It means... To touch, touching, that may or may not happen. Possible. Happening by chance, accident? Or well, doesn't the Bible say that the race is not to the swift nor the battle to the strong, but time and chance happeneth unto them all? Yes, but that word chance is not this word chance. That word chance is Paul Gaul, and that's the word intercession. And the Bible says when we don't know what to pray for in Romans 8 and 26, that the Spirit hears our groanings and makes intercession for us. And the word intercede means to, he hears our S-T-E-N-A-Z-O. That's the word groaning, groan. And he tells us to enter ye in at the straight gate. And that word straight is the word stenos. Stenos is the noun. Stenazo, groan, is the verb. And he hears our groans and we say, God, help me. A lot of times people say, Jim, what can I do in this situation? I say, pray, Lord, help. When Paul said, I shall not fear what men will do unto me, the Lord is my helper. And we, I don't pray. I never pray. Larry said, I, I, he said, I never call on men to pray. If you want to pray and you're willing to pray, you tell me and I'll put your name on the pray, praying list and you can be one of, I call on to pray. But Larry said, I don't pray like I used to pray. He said, I pray short prayers. I said, good. We don't want any long prayers like the Pharisees who think to be heard for their much speaking. Because prayer means to bow to the will of God. Now listen to this. Contingent. It means accidental. Well, how can it be accidental if God's planned it all? Unpredictable. <laughs> Nothing is unpredictable with God because dependent on chance, dependent on or up on something uncertain. God's will is certain. He's already declared the end from the beginning and everything that's going to happen. comes from the word contingency, which means something whose occurrence depends on chance or uncertain conditions. God says, I sure do hope you will accept me because I'm going to send you to hell uh, if you don't, but if you will, I'll change my mind and my will and I'll send you to heaven. 
You mean God's will never changes? No, sir, Ray. Nope. What about the Bible when it says, if my people, which are called by my name? That's Second Chronicles. Isn't that 714? Yeah, 714. Let's go to Second Chronicles. Seven. I'll, I'll finish. Let's go to Second Chronicles 714. Hold your place there. We'll come back. Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles 7. We're going to read this like it's written in the text, okay? Can I do that? I'm going to do it anyway. Will you let me know? Okay. All right. Second Chronicles 7. <coughs> 14. Let's read. Let's start reading in verse 12. And the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said unto him, I have heard thy prayer, and I have chosen this place to myself for a house of sacrifice. I'm, I'm reading 12. I'm reading 12. We're going to read down. Uh, I'll read that last verse. And have chosen this place to myself for an house of sacrifice. I shut up heaven. No. It's not in the text. I shut up heaven that there be no rain. Or I command the locusts to devour the land. Or I send pestilence among my people. My people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves. That's what the original text says, because if it's not there, that was added. There is no if you will do this if contingency. It's not there. You say, doesn't the Bible say might a lot? Let me read this. If my people which are called by my name shall... Let's read it again. I messed up. <laughs> my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves. When? When God gets through with the sword, the famine, the pestilence, the beast, after 2,600 years in captivity, after they've been slaughtered, he said, I will bring them back in the 36th chapter of Ezekiel, 36th chapter, and he said, I will take away their stony heart. I will give them a heart of place. They're not going to change their own hearts. My people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves. And pray they'll bow to me and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. That's when, then, will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. He's not saying if anything. That is not in the text. You say, doesn't the Bible, doesn't the Bible say might a bunch of times in the New Testament that we might be called the sons of God? Why don't you look at something? Hey, Jim, is that, is that word where it says in uh, uh, 14, uh, then will I hear from heaven after he tells us to happen? Is that the contingency word? Well, there's not, a con there's not a contingency. The point is, it's not if they do anything. If is not in the text. What I'm trying to tell you, that was mistranslated. Why does it not tell us? There's a lot of words that are not italicized. They added it for what they thought was the sake of clarity. Yeah. It's not clear because he didn't say if. And you know how in the New Testament when he says, my old concordance about war out, where he'll talk about that mortality might be swallowed up of life, that we might be made the righteousness of God. That sounds like a conditional word, doesn't it? Look over there. There are no numbers. There are no numbers in the concordance. Might. The only time might is used is 1411. Do y'all remember that word? Dunamis. Power. It's not talking about a contingence. May, might, must, can, could. Not maybe. If the, con the contingency of that word might, that we might be called the sons of God, that's not in the text. Whether people like it or not, it's never there when maybe if, you will only maybe. See, God's will is not contingent on what we will do. He said, my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves. They will pray and seek my face when I get through with them. He, because Paul said he has not forsaken his people whom he foreknew. And that don't mean foreknew about. 
doesn't say for whom he did foreknow about, he also did predestinate. Foreknow is the word prognosco. It means to know exactly beforehand. Comes from progenitor, which means the father of the family, and progeny means children, and progeno meaning parent. He's preparated us. So those words, you better look them up in your book. And the only time the word might is there when it has to do with power, not maybe. See, now let me write it down again. Let me write it down again. I've done this for people. I was always real good at memory work, and I remember a lot of things when I was in school. And y'all ought to write these down. I'm going to write them down up here. These are all the being verbs in the English language, and I put them down because being means existence. When he said he gave us the power to become the sons of God, the word power is exousia. It means existence in the word to be, to be. That means existence. Well, when we're birthed, we come into being. We become a being. What'd you start to say, C? I was going to ask you, is that olam, does that carry the same connotation as the existence? No, A-I-O-N, A-I-O-N, I-O-S, or O-S. Ionos, that's the word everlasting. Everlasting in the Old and New Testament, that's the New Testament word. Now, the word to be means to exist. To come into being, to come into existence. You remember when he said, and people say, yes, but as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God. The word received does not mean accept. The word received is L-A-M-B-A-N-O. Except it's not that exact word. That's the basic word. It's actually a derivation of that in the Greek. It's E-L-A-B-O-N, Elabon. And that word Elabon, the word lambano means to take hold. Now, you cannot take hold of your father's hand. You can't take hold of your father's hand until after you're born. You can't reach out and take hold of your mother till your birth. As many as receive. Now, the word Elabon, when they place the, the epsilon in front of it and they change the word ending, and that's what's called ARS active. A-O-R active. When you have ARS coupled with active, it means constant, continual, over and over. A constant taking hold. Well, Isaiah 64 and 7 says, There is none that stirreth up himself to call upon thee. He said, There's none. Look at that. I'll come back to, we'll go back over here. Let's go back <coughs> to Isaiah, <coughs> Isaiah 64. 64 and 7. 64 and 7. Let's read 6. Now, that's, this verse 6 is what you're going to have to come to God with. Now, I'm going to read it. I'm going to read a portion of it the way it's read in the original text. And we are all as an unclean thing... And all our righteousnesses are as a filthy minstrel cloth. That's what it says. Now, everything that's righteous in you is as a filthy minstrel cloth, and that's the only thing you can come to God with. How are you going to get there? Huh? You're not going to do it. And we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities are like the wind and have taken us away. There is none that calleth upon thy name. None seeks after God. None's good. Every minute his best state is zero. Vanity. There's none that stirreth up himself. That word stirreth up is U-W-R. And it means to wake oneself up from the dead. Nobody wakes himself from the dead to take hold of thee. Nobody's going to Elabon continue one time, much less continually, unless he has spiritual life in him. So as many as received him, to them gave he the power, exousia, E-X-O-U-S-I-A, and we get the word existence from that, E-X-E-S-T-I, and we get the word e e i n a i, and that is the word to be. 
To become a being, he gives us the existence to be. He gives us the power to become, and the word become is G-I-N-O-M-A-I. -I, and that means we get our word gene, we get the word genesis, we get the word nativity, which is birth. We, this means to become a living being. He gives us existence to become, and only the ones that he gives existence to become reaches out and takes hold of God. But the taking hold comes about after he births us and causes us to be. I was going to write this down. Let me write, let me write this down. I'll hold my place right there. Fold it back. Now, these are the being verbs. Anything that has being has existence. When you're born, when you're born again, you're born not of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God's will. That's what the Bible says in John 1, 13. And here are the being verbs. I, I memorized them, I think, in the 10th grade. This is them. Be, and they're all a form of the verb to be. All of them. These, in the, in, the, in the Hebrew mind, that was the only one they had. Now, we've got all these. B is, am, are, was, were, being, been, have, have, has, had, do, does, did, Shall, will, should, would, may, might, must, can, could. Well, you see, some of these look contingent. They are. Need to strike might. Among the Hebrews... They didn't have any past tense. You can strike was. You can strike were. You can strike anything that shows past tense or future tense. They, it was all now. And they had one copula. Copula, we get a word copulate. That means movement. We get what they had one copula. And they said that it always concerning God existed with that's the only thing that has power and if there is any will it's God and his will does not change and it's never contingent on anything we do because if it is his will changes doesn't it now let's go back over here to Isaiah 64 and then we'll go back to Ecclesiastes 3 there's none that calleth upon thy name that wakes himself up from the dead to take hold of thee for thou hast hid thy face from us and hast consumed us because of our iniquities. But now, O Lord, 64 and 8, look at this. But now, O Lord, thou art our Father. Ab means to will or decide or desire. You're the one that desired us. And we are the clay and we have all the power and the will to come to you. How stupid. You mean a clay? A, a piece of clay. You know what it makes me think of? You know those little cartoons that are made out of clay and they get them walking around and all of a sudden what they're saying is that we can do what that little piece of clay does on that cartoon film. Y'all, You know what I'm talking about? He goes, yeah, and he goes, it raises itself up. It's a pile of clay and it goes, arms pop out, nose pops out and it starts going, and some guy has set that thing up a hundred and five hundred times just to get that thing to walk over here. But believe me, that piece of clay on that little cartoon didn't make itself get up and walk any more than me and you do. That's what they're saying that man's will can do. He's a pile of clay, he's a pile of dung, and he just raised himself up, and somebody can film you while you do it. Isn't that dumb? We are the clay, and thou art potter, and we all are the work of thy hand. Now back to Ecclesiastes 
Yeah, we like this. Now I'm going to read 1450 one more time. I know that whatsoever God doeth, that's everything. It shall be forever. Nothing can be put to it, nor anything taken from it. And God doeth it that men should fear before him. That which hath been is now. What has been in the mind of God from eternity is going on right now. And that which is to be, that which is going to be and going to happen, this is that that he's declared the end from the beginning, from ancient times, the things that are not yet done. That which is to be has already been in the mind of God. It's already fixed from forever, and it can't be changed. And God requireth that which is past, in his mind, he requires it to come to pass. Mm -hmm. Now that's called the sovereign will of the living God. Yeah. It's not contingent. God's not contingent on nothing. Let me read. Now I'm going to go over here. Let's read over here in the sixth chapter of Hebrews. Go to the sixth chapter of Hebrews. The problem is we don't know who God is and we don't know who we are. We're a we're a slug, and he is a great, terrible God. See, Jim, I don't like it. We'll read that in a minute, how he's a terrible God. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Y'all realize that this verb to be is everything that this is about? If we have being and we have existence, what we're trying to say as we as dead people, we birthed ourselves and we cookened ourselves from the dead and we walk ourselves up from the dead and we begin to call upon God by our own free will and he says, oh, I was going to send you to hell but since you did that, I won't. I've changed my mind. Nope. Nope, can't be done. Cannot be done. Now, I want you to read with me here in Hebrews, the sixth chapter. I got two Bibles. I'm trying to break one in. I don't want to give up my own. All right. Hebrews 6, verse 10. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which you have showed toward his name, in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. And we desire that every one of you do show the great, the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end. That don't mean I hope I get to the end. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. Hope means dependent upon a promise. God made a promise by his will. He doesn't change. And if we come alive, if we come alive, it'll be because he's already ordained it from eternity. The if only applies to man's thoughts. It doesn't apply to God's. That ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. And when God made promise to Abraham because... <laughs> he could swear by no greater. He swear by himself. And he confirmed the covenant with the blood of Christ is what he did. And I don't have time to go into covenant. Saying, surely blessing I will bless thee and multiplying I will multiply thee. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men verily swear by the greater and an oath or confirmation is to them an end of all strife, wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his will. The word counsel is the word will. It comes from the word will. The immutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath. Now, let me give you the word immutable, okay? okay. I like this. I saw something about this word that's so good. Immutable. Y'all ought to write these down. I'll leave them up there for a little bit, but you really need those being verbs. If you ever come into being, it's the will of God that does it. Now, God's will is unchangeable. It never changes and so if it never changes, and what he has done, he has willed from forever, and it always has been, and it always will be, then what we do is not what God's will is contingent on. Contingent means to be conditional. His will is not conditioned by what we do. 
In fact, our will is bound to sin, and that's all it can do. Now, here's the word immutable. The word immutable is A-M-E-T-A, T-H-E-T-O-S. Now, the alpha, this is good. This is about predestination, what it's about. A metathetos, but it comes from the alpha negates the word. That's called, I've said it so many times, I'm going to keep writing it. When you put the alpha, sometimes on the front end of a word, it's a connecting particle, very seldom. It means it's connecting some words. But here it is called the alpha privative, P-R-I. I'm glad my wife remembers all this. Because that way, when I'm not here, somebody said, what is that alpha called on the front of a word? She can say, that's alpha primitive. And that negates the word and gives an opposite meaning. Now, so it's no methodos for God. Metamethodos, excuse me, meta, it's no metamethodos for God. God does not do any metamethatos because we got the alpha in front of it, so it negates metamethatos. All we got to do is find out what metamethatos is, okay? Metamethatos comes from two words, meta. The fellowship is God's. He does not. Meta, oh, excuse me. Oh, metathetos, metathetos. It comes from meta and T I T H E M I. Now, that word tithame means to level in passive, horizontal. Posture. You remember that word? You remember that comes from the word. The word tithme is the word. We get it from the word E-U-T-H-U-S. That is the baptism. John came preaching the baptism of repentance. When we repent, we turn from self to God. And, and euthus is the word straight. It's prepare you the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And euthus means a well. E-U means well. We get e u L-O-G-Y, that's well words, you logos, you, T-I-T-H-E-M-I, and that word tithme, when we are straightened, we level to the will of God. God is not going to go in fellowship with anyone and level to their will. He is not. His will is unchangeable. The fellowship is his. The fellowship is his suffering. That I may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. He is not going to accompany. And accompany. That word meta means accompany. He's not going to accompany us in our will and level to our will ever. And if his will is contingent on what we're going to do, and we say, okay, I'll accept you. He says, okay, I'll level to your will. No, sir. Right. Now, that's what that word immutability means. Now, what is it that's immutable? The word counsel. The word immutable means unchangeable. His will is unchangeable. He will never agree with the will of man ever. Now, that's how unchangeable his will is. Now, what is it that's immutable? His counsel. The word counsel is the word. Here's the word counsel. Well, these pens are giving out. I need some new pens. No. Counsel. That's a mess, ain't it? Can't read nothing on the TV. C-O-U-N-S-E-L. Now, here's the word counsel. It is the word... B O U L E. Boule. Boule. It means will. It means purpose. 
Man cannot purpose his own salvation. Let's look at the words for this purpose. His will is unchangeable. His will is not contingent on what you and I do. It's not contingent on if we would accept him, he will change his mind. Wait a minute, did Paul, wait a minute, didn't God repent of Saul and change his mind about Saul? Uh, now, wait a minute. Let's look at that. Okay. We'll come back. Wh where am I? How much time do I have? Uh, let's look at Saul real quick, and we'll come back to his unchangeable will. Let's go over here. Now, let's look at Saul. Go to 1 Samuel 15 and 35. 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel 15. 1 Samuel. Wait a minute. All right, wait a minute. I gotta get something else together here. Wait a minute. Okay. Now, yeah, I gotta give you this. This is good. People say now, now God changed His mind about Saul. He changed His will, didn't He? No, He didn't. No, nah, no. Nah. Okay, let's look here. And now I want to show you why God plans these things the way He does. 1 Samuel 15, Saul had not done the righteous will of God, but God had planned it that way. And how do you know, Jim? Well, I'll show you in a minute. 1 Samuel 15 and verse 35, Saul, remember from the beginning, from the first, Saul never did the righteousness of God. And in, uh, Samuel comes to him and says, go down to Amalek, the Amalekites tried to they attack uh, Israel without any provocation when they were coming out of Egypt. And he said, I want you to uh, go down there and utterly kill everybody in Amalek. Slaughter everything, men, women, children. Wait a minute, it don't sound like the God we know, does it? No, no, it don't sound like a, like a 20th century Baptist Church of Christ Catholic God. That's what it don't sound like. And Saul went down and he said, and when he came back, Samuel came to him. And Samuel was the prophet of God. Everybody was scared to death of Samuel because he could call down fire from heaven when he got ready. They're going, oh, <laughs> and Saul, the king of Israel, was scared of Samuel the prophet, even though he lived off by himself in a cave somewhere. And he was always walking around by himself. There's a little man walking in the dusk of the evening. Who is that? That's Samuel. Shh. Don't say nothing. Maybe he won't come over here. <laughs> Samuel said, verse 22, hath the Lord, he said, Saul, did you go and destroy everybody at Amalek? Did you kill all the men, women, and children like God commanded? Well, yes. Well, isn't that King Agag over there? What's he doing here? What are these sheep that I hear? Well, I wanted to sacrifice to God, and I'm only the king of Israel. People made me do this. <laughs> yeah, sure, Saul. And what did he say to him? What did he say to him? He said, Samuel said, verse 22, Hath the Lord great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? He wanted all these animals dead. And he wanted the babies dead down there too. People say, boy, I don't like that. Well, that's your problem because that's this book. <laughs> Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft. Now that word witchcraft is kosam. Q-E-C-E-M. Q-E-C-E-M. It means smooth talk. It means rebellion is smooth talk. It's talking soft and easy. Mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrines that ye have learned and avoid them because these serve not our Lord but their own belly and by good words and fair speeches. And by smooth talk, they deceive the hearts of the simple, these real smooth-talking preachers. And God's going to bring judgment on them. Then he says, then he says, to obey is better than sacrifice. Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and your stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. God says, I'm fed up with King Saul. And he says here in verse 35, 
Well, let's read 26. Samuel said unto Saul, I will not return with thee, for thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord hath rejected thee from being king over Israel. But you see, God had always rejected Saul. Look at verse 35, 34 and 35. Then Samuel went to Ramah, and Saul went up to his house to Gibeah of Saul, and Samuel came no more to see Saul until the day of his death. Nevertheless, Samuel mourned for Saul, and the Lord had repented that he had made Saul king over Israel. Wait a minute. You mean God changed his mind? The word repent means to turn. Now, let's go back over here to Genesis. Where was the king in Israel going to come from? Judah. Judah. Had God already promised that? Yeah. Had he already ordained it? Yeah. Now go over here to Genesis, 49th chapter. Jacob's name had been changed to Israel. The scripture says it came time that Israel had to die. And he gathered all his 12 sons around him. Verse 1 of chapter 49, Jacob called unto his sons and said, Gather yourselves together that I may tell you that which shall befall you in the last days. Gather yourselves together and hear, ye sons of Jacob, and hearken unto Israel your father. I'm your father Israel. It came time for Israel to die in Egypt. Reuben, you're the firstborn. You're my firstborn, my might, my beginning of my strength, the excellency of my dignity, an excellency of power. You're unstable as water. You went in to Bilhah, the handmaiden, and you defile the bed, and I'm taking the, I'm taking the inheritance away from you, and I'm going to give it to Joseph, my 11th son. And we're going to give it to his second-born son, Ephraim. And he gets the inheritance of all Israel, and Ephraim will take care of everyone. And he goes on down, and he, he said, You're unstable as water, thou shalt not excel, because you went into thy father's bed and defiled it. Verse 5, Simeon and Levi, brethren, instruments of cruelty are their habitations, when the Canaanites lay with Dinah, their sister, Simeon and Levi went in. Simeon was leading them and said, we'll slaughter them. We'll circumcise all of them. And then we'll kill them. And they did. Oh, my soul, come not thou into their secret, into their assembly. Cursed be their anger, in verse 7, for it was fierce, and their wrath, for it was cruel. I'll divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. Now look at verse 8. Judah, thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise. Thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemies. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. The king will come out of Judah. That's what he says in verse 9 and 10. Judah is a lion swept from the prey. My son, thou art gone up. He stooped down, he couched as a lion, and as a lion, who shall rouse him up? The scepter. Now they would sit down on their thrones, and they would spread their legs out, and they would lay the scepter between their feet, and it would lean, the one that they ruled with. Give me a chair. A picture's worth a thousand words. This is what it said. Let me have your chair just a second. Stand. This is the way they did. And when they ruled, they did like this. The scepter was here, and that's what they ruled with. Now this is what it says. The king would hold his scepter like that, and when he was ready to, to bless someone or do something, he'd raise his scepter. And that's why it puts it this way. The scepter shall not depart from Judah. Never will it leave Judah. I've got a king that will come out of Judah. Nor a lawgiver from between his feet. The law will come from the king. Judah, the fourthborn of Israel, the fourthborn of Jacob, until Shiloh comes. Shiloh is the word shalom. Peace, that's Christ. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be. The king will come out of Judah. Wait a minute. Let's go back over here and let's look over here. 
in the, let's go back to First Chronicles. Let's verify that one more time. Verify it one more time. Verify it one more time. First Chronicles. Here it is. Chapter 2. No, wait a minute. No. Chapter 5, excuse me. Chapter 5, I've been teaching out of 2 on Sunday morning. Chapter 5, verse 1. Now the sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Jacob, Israel was his name, for he was the firstborn, but for as much as he defiled his father's bed, his birthright was given unto the sons of Joseph, the son of Israel, and the genealogy is not to be reckoned after the birthright. For Judah prevailed among his brethren, and of him came the chief ruler, the king. But the birthright was Joseph's through his son Ephraim. Now, let's go over here to 1 Samuel. Let's see what tribe that Saul was in. This is long before God repented of Saul. This is just as God is about to call Saul. Chapter 9 of 1 Samuel, verse 1. And there was a man of Benjamin. 1 <laughs> first, first Samuel 9 and verse 1. Now God repented of Saul because he already had it planned to repent of Saul. He already had it worked out in his will to repent of Saul. He had, well, remember that an evil spirit from the Lord entered Saul when he anointed David as king. Saul was never meant to be king. It was not God that appointed him king. The people went to Samuel and they said, Samuel, all the rest of the people have a king. Give us a king that he may rule over us. And Samuel went to the Lord and said, Lord, what shall I do? These people have rejected me. He said, no, they haven't rejected you. They've rejected me from being king. And then he said, here's a captain for them. Give him Saul. And Samuel went before the people and he said, Behold the king whom ye have chosen. See, God had already had it planned to turn. And when God repented, he got angry. He had to plan his anger because he wanted his anger to be known. That's what he said. Now look here. Now there was a man of Benjamin. Judah and Benjamin were the two southern tribes. But I'm not sorry to tell you the king will never come out of Benjamin. And from David on, we went through the kings here several years ago, and always it would seem like all the kings would get killed off. In northern Israel, the king wasn't going to come out of northern Israel. Northern Israel was led by the inheritance of Israel, Ephraim. But southern Judah was led by Judah, and that was the fourth son of Jacob. And what's so funny, if I can find it here, we went through the kings, and it's so good, I like this. And the kings of Judah, the kings of Judah over here, here's the kings of Judah. And God got down here to Ahaziah, and Ahaziah was a wicked king. And his mother was Athaliah. She, got, she became king once. That's a woman right there. That's his mother. And she said, I will kill all of my son's children. I'll kill all my grandsons. I'm going to be queen. I'm going to be king. I'm going to run the show. And she went out and slaughtered all of Ahaziah's sons except one. And they didn't know where Joash was. She thought she got them all. And the high priest took him and hid him. And then when he got... Then when he got big enough and grew up, she brought him out and said, Behold the king, Joash! And after I went, where am I going to go? And I preached a message called the threads of scripture. And as much as they tried to stop the lineage of Judah, it never departed until Jesus came. And it was still here then. But Joash was just a little bitty boy, and they hid him till he got grown. And the priest brought him out and said, here's Judah's king. It's not that goofball woman there. And he was still there being hidden. And the scepter really never departed from Judah as far as God was concerned. 
The king of Israel was not Athaliah. That's just the account, man's account. The king of Israel was that one that was hiding inside the temple of God that the high priest was keeping him away from everybody. <laughs> that's just like when David was anointed king and he went out against Goliath. The only reason they could win is because David was king. When he was the shepherd boy, he was already anointed king of Israel. Saul was out as far as God was concerned. Maybe not as far as the people, but as far as God was concerned, it was over. And it says, there was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, the son of Abiel, the son of Zeror, the son of Bekorah, the son of Aphiah, a Benjamite, a mighty man of power, and he had a son whose name was Saul, a choice young man and goodly. And there was not among the children of Israel a goodlier person than he. He was a friend of the world. Everybody liked him. From his shoulders and upward, he was higher than any of the people. He was the tallest man around. <laughs> see, but you see, and back over there in the 16th chapter, you see, God had already planned the change. And if you go back to the 16th chapter, first verse, and the Lord said unto Samuel, verse 1, How long wilt thou mourn over Saul, seeing I have rejected him for reigning over Israel? Fill thine horn with oil and go. I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king among his sons. Why? Judah. And there's going to be an everlasting king there. And this is my first king of Israel. Saul was never king of Israel as far as God was concerned. God was still king. It was only when God made the choice, not the people. So he already had his repentance of Saul planned because he already had made his choice of Judah, never Benjamin. So when it says he repented of Saul, he didn't mean he went, oh, I just can't get Saul to do what I want him to do. <laughs> it's not what he was doing. It was planned. And he went down there and they, I, I love verse 4, Samuel did that which the Lord spake and came to Bethlehem and the elders of the town trembled at his coming because he could call fire from heaven. He said, uh, what are you doing down here? Uh, this is Mayor Samuel. Uh, uh, could, could we do something for you? When the prophets came around, they were little guys that come along with Would y'all like some fire today? <laughs> <laughs> That's, you remember how you can tell an evil prophet if anything that he says doesn't come to pass in the last verse of Deuteronomy 18, you don't have to be afraid of him. He can't call fire down. See, that's why they did this. That's why we were afraid of him. They petrified out of the mind of Samuel. They knew he could say, oh, God says, if you don't listen to my prophet, I'll give him the word and he'll kill everybody in the town. He'll just raise his hand and y'all fall dead if that's what I want. Don't his name mean after God? Yes, it means heard of God. It comes from Shama El. Shama is here, the hearing eye, ear, and the seeing eye. The Lord hath made even both of them. And the word Shama means to hear or obey. And Samuel heard and obeyed God. And the elders of the town trembled at his coming and said, Comest thou peaceably? He said, yeah, there's a king here. And what's so funny, what's so amazing, he went down there and they marched Eliab, the oldest son of David, uh, the oldest son of Jesse out there. And he was the tallest guy in the family and he looked like Saul. And what's so, what's so funny is Samuel said, what a man. And Jesse said, isn't he something? This is my eldest in life. If it's a king, it's got to be him. And God said, no. Man looks at the outward appearance. I look at the heart. And besides, I've already got him picked. He's the runt of the litter. His name is David. He's the shepherd boy. Yeah, that's what he was. Thank God that God doesn't look. If he looked at the outward appearance, I wouldn't be preaching. Mm. Now, you say, but didn't God repent of making man after the flood? Let's look at that. I'm not going to get back to We're going to stay with his unchangeable counsel. He turned from Indian Lake on the Gallatin, didn't he? 
Yeah. <laughs> well, it, that's exactly what it means. Thank you, Brooks. It's like if I say I'm going to the grocery store, the word repent means to turn. I'm going to have to plant a turn up here at Maple. I got to plant a turn on Indian Lake Road, and I got to plant a turn at Goucher Road, and I got to plant another turn in the Crows if I'm going to the grocery store. I got to plan those turns, don't I? God planned his turn. Now, look here. Now, look, look, let's go over here and look at. Isn't that good? Don't you like that? Now, look here. Look here. See, God's counsel never changes. Look at Genesis 6. Look at Genesis 6. Oh, I like this. See, God's will is immutable. It never changes. And it's not contingent on anything that Saul did, was it? First of all, Saul wasn't a righteous king. He was a Benjamin, and he was never intended to be the king by God. What God intends to be, will be. David was the king of Judah. Now, David did some pretty bad things, wouldn't you think? Uh, but hey, got any bad sinners here? You think you're worse than David? Have you ever murdered anybody? King David has. Huh? Now, I'm talking about, have you ever gone out and had somebody killed? There's a guy out here at Riverbend right now, and he had his pictures in the paper last month with the guy he hired to kill his wife, and they're both on death row. All he did was have somebody killed. David had a man killed, then married his wife. He had already committed adultery with her. Isn't it, I, I, wondered, I wonder what David's going to say to Uriah when he gets to heaven. Good thing God's going to forgive all thoughts, isn't it? He's probably going to walk in with his head down. So Uriah had so much trouble over that. Please forgive me. His life was miserable because of that. Nathan said, the sword will never leave your house. And it didn't. David wept and cried all, his, all of his life. Start in the 50th Psalm and read it through about the 70th Psalm. He'd say, my enemies are compassing me about. They're laying a... They're digging a pit for me. God, help! That was the King David of Israel. He hired a murderer named Joab, his commanding general, to do the job on Uriah, and he did, and he could never get rid of him. And Joab said, I got control of the army. Don't tell me what to do, David. You're at my mercy. Did y'all know that? David was just a king. Jo Joab was a five-star general. And the armies did what he said, not what David said. Whew. That's strong, isn't it? Mm. Now look here. Look at Genesis 6. And I said verse 6, didn't I? Is that what I said? Yeah. Okay, look here at 6. Oops, I'm at 12. I'll never get there. Genesis 6, verse 6. <sighs> Well, let's look at five. God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And he repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart. The Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air. For it repenteth me that I have made them. And Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. In the 11th chapter of Hebrews, the scripture says, By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his household. He was saved by grace through faith. He wasn't saved by works. Same, same we are because he believed God. Belief is faith. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing and obeying are the same word. And when God says, humble, strive, agonize, we say, okay. He said, Noah, build an ark. He said, okay. That's what he did. But he repented God that he made man. Well, he had to plan the repentance. So let's look at it back here in the first chapter of Genesis. Go back to the first chapter of Genesis. Huh. Verse 6. How did he destroy the earth? With water. Yep. And by faith Noah being warned of God of things not seen as yet. It had never rained for 1,356 years. Never rained upon the face of the earth. By faith, nor being warned of God of things not seen as yet, it had never rained before. I'll show you in a minute, okay? 
Verse 6. God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven. And the evening and the morning were the second day. And let me do this right if I can find it, okay? Okay, here it is. The heavens is the firmament. That's the open space that we call the atmosphere above us. So what God did, here's what he did. Now, I want to show you, when God repents, all he does is plan his turns, is all he does. He put water. Then he put the air here, and he put the waters of the earth down here. And this was the waters above the firmament, and God reserved flood waters for a later date. <laughs> You say, how do you know it didn't rain? Go to the second chapter of Genesis. <laughs> Verse 6. But there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. Now, why did God, huh? The verse before said had not caused it. Okay, we'll read that. And every plant of the field before it was in the earth, and every herb of the field before it grew, for the Lord had not caused it to rain upon the earth. There was not a man to till the ground. And they went up a mist, and that's how they got their water. Now let's go to Hebrews 11 and look at that other verse that I've quoted. So you see, God planned his turning for man, didn't he? What was, what was the woman's curse? Travail in, in childbirth, wasn't it? Well, do you think God only created the reproductive organs after she sinned? <laughs> That's stupid, isn't it? <laughs> no. No, that was all planned from the start, too. You think God made man out of corrupt dust, put him in a garden with a tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and he created the evil, and he created the corrupt dust, and he says, Thou shalt not, and you think he actually believed Adam had the ability not to sin? No, he went straight to it. He corrupted the seventh day is what he did. He never did eat of the trees of the garden, did he? Because, you remember, he put a cherubim up to guard the garden lest he go back in and eat of the tree of life and live. He went straight to evil. You know what he did? He, he polluted the Sabbath is what he did. He created, man in six day. he created man on the sixth day and put him in the garden on the seventh and he went straight to his evil and did what man always does. He polluted the Sabbath. Now look at Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11, verse 7. By faith, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah was saved by grace through faith. Noah was saved, Ephesians 2, 8, by grace are you saved through faith. Wasn't he? Yes, he was. By faith, Noah being warned of God of things not seen as yet. It was 1,356 years. It had never rained before. To say rain is going to fall from the sky Everyone with half sense of one-eyed mule knew that it did not come from the sky. It came out of the ground. What's the matter with you, Noah? Are you nuts? Besides that, you're building an ark in your backyard. <laughs> he didn't go down to the river to build it. Why would he go to the river? The whole world's going to be a river. <laughs> that was probably one of the reasons he was laughing at him. Might as well the were coming out of the sky. Yeah. Might as well say cats and dogs are going to fall out of the sky. Anvils, bang, bang, bang. God says, I'm going to rain anvils. Because nobody had ever seen it rain. But you see, God reserved the waters in the first chapter of Genesis. He planned his turning, didn't he? You see, when God repents, he doesn't go, I just, I'm so sad I can't get this right. <laughs> You're dumb. By faith, Noah being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. <coughs> and faith is the substance. And why, well, why would God do that intentionally? Well, back to Romans 9. 
Back to Romans 9. Here it is right here. Oh, me. Romans 9. You see, when God does something, when God does it, he does it forever. He never did plan for Saul to be king. When he repented of Saul, you think he was angry at Saul? He was furious. You think he was angry at man? Why, he said, I'm going to show my wrath. You see, since nothing has power over God, if he's going to show his wrath, he's got to plan his wrath, doesn't he? Because nothing could erase, nothing in this universe would be anything but a gnat. It would be less than a gnat. It's a zero. Nothing could raise itself up against God unless God prearranged it. Now, here's the point. People say, well, not just why would he do that. He tells you exactly why he planned to turn from Saul and he turned from the world. He planned it ahead of time because he wants to show who he is. That's the whole point. Romans 9 and 22, it says. And this don't mean, what if? It actually just says, God willing to show his wrath. Willing is the word thaleo. T-H-E-L-E-O. That means determined. God was determined to show his wrath so he had to make some men and raise them up against him and say, now my children of mercy, watch my furry, flaming terror. He planned his wrath. That's what he did. That's why he did it. <laughs> what if God, not what if, God determined to show his wrath and make his power known he couldn't do it just on you and I. If all he had was vessels of mercy, he couldn't do it. So in order to have sweet, you've got to have sour or salt. You know how oatmeal tastes real drab when you put sugar in it? Season it with salt, and it tastes sweet. Some people don't know how to make oatmeal. You'll see me put salt in my oatmeal and then put sugar in it. And if you don't put salt in it, it tastes dead, doesn't it? And what gives the sweetness the sweet flavor is the salt. Isn't that right? Salt is the same way. Yep. And if you don't do that, See, in order to have good, you've got to have bad. In order to have up, you've got to have down. In order to have good, you've got to have evil. So that's why he made evil. He said, I'm the Lord, do all things. I make peace and create evil. He said, God willing to show his wrath. God was determined to show. It doesn't mean I'm willing. The word is thaleo. God determined to show his wrath and make his power known. And he endured with much long suffering. The vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. He said, I've got to bring men and rise them up against me, vessels of wrath, so I can let fire fly from my nostrils. And so people can know who I am. And we can back away and go, oh, God, you are God. Oh, man. And look at verse 23. And that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy which he had afore prepared unto glory. That word of four prepared is the word proetoia mazo. It means to fit up in advance. Same word, same word. It's only mentioned twice in the New Testament when he said, We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. What Whew. scripture is that, Jim? Ephesians 2 10. Let me just give you two verses. I'm out of time. But I want to show you who God is, and we'll stop. They don't know. People. No. Well, I'm out of time. Goodness, I've got so many more things I'd like to.
Well, let me just let me just give you this. Let me just give you this. Go to Deuteronomy 7:21. 7:21. Go to Deuteronomy. The reason people don't want to believe this about God is they don't know who He is. He is not the sissy that this 1997 church has invented or created in the last 150 years. He's not some pansy. This is what people don't understand. Look at Deuteronomy 7:21. 7, 7 in verse 21. Here's who God is. 7 verse 21. Thou shalt not be affrighted at them, for the Lord thy God is among you, a mighty God and a terrible. So he is. You think he's some Jesus is loving. God is loving. He loves everybody. No, he doesn't. He hated Esau before he was born. He fitted him as a vassal of wrath. People say, well, why would he do that? Who art thou that replies against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, why hast thou made me thus, or them thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor if that's what he wants? Yes, he can. To say that any different is a lie. Look over here at Deuteronomy 10, 17. Yes. I hate free will. 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 I hate. We're going we're gonna to get us a song and sing. I hate free will. I hate free will. I hate free will. It stinks. <laughs> yes. Look at 10 17. Deuteronomy 10 and 17. For the Lord thy, the Lord your God is a God of gods, a Lord of lords, a great God, a mighty, and a terrible, which regardeth not persons, nor taketh reward. He doth execute the judgment of the fatherless and the widow, and loveth the stranger, and gives him food and raiment. He don't oppress the poor like some preachers do. And that's in, I wish I had time to go through all these. I'm going to save some of these for next week. I got a whole list of these on terrible God. You know what that word terrible is? <coughs> it's the word. Yare. That means to be frightened, to shake and quake. Let me give you. Let me give you that word yare in one other verse. Okay. Turn over to just this verse. Psalms one eleven nine. This is the only place this word is mentioned in the Bible. Psalms 111 and verse 9. He sent redemption unto his people. He hath commanded his covenant forever, holy and reverend, terrible. Yahweh is his name. Reverend belongs to no man. Don't ever call me reverend or any other preacher reverend. That belongs to no man. God said, reverend is his name. There ain't no such thing as Reverend Jones and Reverend Brown. That means you are terrified of them. What does that word then mean, uh, Jim? Reverend, actually, what's it? Yahweh. Same word as fear. fear. It means to quake into shake and to be frightened of. Don't stick at it. comes from the word revere. Revere don't mean we look up to God. It means to be frightened out of your mind, huh? Yeah, Paul Revere. Yeah, we Paul Revere God. Yeah. So don't call no man reverend. No man, don't call me that. What can I call you? Preacher? Somebody said, Jim said, can I call you pastor? Well, pastor comes from pasture, and I lead the sheep to pasture. It's exactly what I am. You can call me preacher. I'll tell you what you can call me. Jim, that's my name. <laughs> you couldn't call you can call me doctor. Let me, let me give you one other verse here. Let me give you one other verse. Okay. And it makes me mad, these guys. I think it's here in Job, right? Yeah. Right here. Wait a minute. Hold on. Uh, yeah, here it is. 
in Job 32, 21. Let me not, I pray you, accept any man's person, neither let me give flattering titles unto man. Call no man rabbi or master or reverend or any of those things. Doesn't belong to anybody but God. You got one master in heaven. You got one rabbi. And that word is the word kana, the word flattering titles, K-A-N-A-H. K-A-N-A-H. And it means to add additional name to eulogize or surname himself. M-D. P. H D Fud. Job 32:21. For I know not to give flattering titles, and so doing, my Maker would soon take me away. God will kill me when I start respecting men. Don't call anybody PhD. And, and don't people? Do you know you can buy those doctor's degrees and titles? Huh? I'm like, I like what one guy said. I like what one preacher said. Master of theology. I don't know anybody that's mastered this book. Never met anybody that's mastered this book. I study it all the time. And I feel like a flea when I'm studying it. Gosh, what, how can we as men ever learn? Isn't that something? Yeah. Yeah. Does that tie back and equate with uh, Bowing to? Yeah, I was going to bring out Shana. I, did, I had that on my list first. I change not. means mutate, transmute. I never have two meanings. I don't ever mutate my will. It's always the same from forever to forever. So when you're talking about the will of God, His will is not contingent on us. Next week, I'm going to go back into the bondage of the will and read about His contingent will. This man makes me think. He really makes me think with this book. And uh, I don't always agree with Martin Luther on everything, but I don't even agree with Jim Brown on what he used to preach 30 years ago, <laughs> 25 years ago. Uh, we all develop in our understanding. Don't give any man flattering titles called no man reverend. That means to be afraid and frightened of. And if you don't, people say, we're not supposed to fear God. Yes, we are. Yes, we are. When the Bible says that God hadn't given us a spirit of fear, that was the word diliah, and it meant timidness concerning going out and preaching. Paul told Timothy, stir up the gift that's in you and go preach to everybody because he hadn't given you the fear of men. Because all these verses, I gave these to some of the people, and all these verses right here are all about fearing God. All these here. It says, Moses was frightened out of his wits when he came near the mountain of God. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for... Uh, a wondrous picture of your unchangeable will. That's not contingent or conditional on, our, on what we are willing to do because we're not willing to do anything unless you make us righteous, unless you birth us in your kingdom by your will. And we'll praise you for everything. God, continue this ministry and may we continue in your service. Deal with our hearts and crush us under your hand. And we'll give you the praise in Christ's name. Amen.